Just another night for supernatural girls. Real stories, real answers to life's biggest supernatural mysteries. And now for another exciting interview with paranormal experts from this world and others. Here's your host, paranormal researcher Patricia Baker, on the one, the only, Supernatural Girls. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of Supernatural Girls. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I'm here with my co-host all the way from sunny Tucson, PK, Patricia Kirkman. How are you doing tonight? Doing fine. Just looking outside, waiting for the rains to start. Wow. It's rain overcast. in the desert. Oh, yeah, but it's, it, I'm glad we've had the rain. We've just had a bit more abundance than I would have liked it. Of late, <laughs> my garage floor is about a uh, quarter inch deep in water. But uh oh, uh, uh oh. So the little well, one gets to go out there and play. <laughs> okay, well that's good. At least somebody's going to benefit from all exactly. of this. Exactly. Well, we've got sunny skies in New England, gorgeous weather in the 70s today. Mm -hmm. Let's hope it stays with us. It's been beautiful. But we have a very exciting guest we're going to bring on in a little while. Oh, my God. And what a great book he's written. Yes, he has. has. Mark O'Connell. Jay Close (laughs) Encounters. Yeah, we both (laughs) got it. For a (laughs) doubleheader, same time. Well, Mark's a fantastic writer. We're going to introduce him shortly, but oh, wow. What a book. What a piece of history he's written. And you guys, you can't miss it. You got to get this book. It is tremendous. But in the meantime, you did a little bit of sleuthing on J. Allen Hynek's numerology. I am dying to hear this. We want to know what's the inner workings of this man. He was such a such a giant in this field. Who was he really? According to the numbers, anyways. According to the numbers, what are the things? Hey, he he wanted to be seen as the best of the best. He thought himself maybe a little bit more like Donald, but without going into that type of an element. But I said to you, I didn't see his size or stature. But I said he gave the impression of everything I'm picking up as a very of a of a shorter man. Mark, am I correct about that? Yes, you are. Okay, because I was uh-huh. picking that up uh, a little Napoleonic type. Could uh-huh. be wrong, but I don't think I am. He lived in his head tremendous a, a tremendous amount of the time. He was always concerned about what was just and fair, like things done, but his way. He had that a need to be in charge or control. I uh, picked up also that he had major issues with the father figure as he was growing up, issues about that. So there would be issues with him dealing with men in this lifetime because of the father element. That's interesting because he was surrounded by men and everything he did, right? Of there were course. very few women astronomers and the professors women. at that time. He liked women. He did. Oh, yes, of he did. Of course. <laughs> of course, but yes, he did. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he is, he had a destiny that uh, made him want to be in control or, or to control things. And this is very good. But his key to success came out of what he did himself. He had to go through a lot of hurdles to be known or well-known in his own right. It's like he had to be the champion. Think of him somewhat of the Napoleonic type. He didn't care whatever they told him he was going to go and go for it anyway. But uh, the, one of the things that showed here, when he was having the different times that he was getting involved with the uh, uh, Project Grudge, he was in a two-personal year there. So it was very important that he became a team player and a partner. Then when he went to uh, uh, this is a blue book. I think is what it is. I, I can't read my own writing. But he was in a five-year. There was major changes that came out of that, which enhanced many of the things that he did thereafter. Uh, he, When I went through this, he's outgoing. He's had, he knows who he, he knew who he was, but he did it creatively. And he gave in, in, uh, his personal stuff very low-key on that. Good communicator. But he had his ideas of what perfection was supposed to be. But he liked to take shortcuts. That's what I was surprised at. Because for someone that knew the things that he did and could work what he did, he take take shortcuts that 
only involved what he himself felt comfortable with. Love changes in his idea of how to put things together. He was looking for this perfection. Good head on his shoulders, uh, very competent. But the two areas that he dealt with karma, one dealt with the details, the other dealt with the world at large. And yet those are the very two things that he pulled together to be who he ended up being. And I noticed the one thing, the date that he passed, he was in a seven-personal month, and he passed on a seven-personal day. Seven is the highest of the spiritual numbers. So during that period of time at, prior to his passing, I think there were a few things that could have made a change, but I think he allowed himself to let go. So that's interesting. Kind of, but yeah, I got that's from great, PK. Thank you so much for taking a look at that because he's he is stellar in his field. I mean, he was amazing, but yet who knew him really personally? And so it's nice to be able for you to take a look internally and see the numbers tell the truth. So, and the you said truth. he skipped a lot of details. That was another thing we were talking about that he yeah. wasn't detail oriented at all, no. which was surprising. He liked to do it his way. He didn't go by what he considered the details of what others saw. And, in fact, actually, the first project uh, side that he was involved in, that was in 189, so it was about the world at large, and that's where he actually started really pushing even more towards what he ended up doing in the end. Tremendous. Well, well thank you. Interesting you stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we always go a little deeper on Supernatural Girls. So, yes, and thank you, PK, for that. Oh, you're welcome. That's great. And then for our Paranormal News segment, what we did was we posted the Montana UFO sighting from 1952, which was mm-hmm. amazing and something that was never debunked. It was um thought to be a true UFO sighting. You will find that on our Facebook page, so make sure you guys go look at it. It is amazing footage. I know for Mark, it's one of his favorite cases. He'd like to be able to take a look at more deeply. We would like that to happen also, Mm -hmm. but for all of you right now, you can just go to the Supernatural Girls Facebook page and look at that footage and a very brief interview with a gentleman, Mr. Newhouse, who took that footage. It was his wife who first spotted the UFOs in the skies, and then he pulled over, pulled his camera out of the trunk of his car (laughs) and, and did his stuff. And here we are today talking about it still. And we're going to hear more about that in a few minutes. But also, we have more Mothman sightings. That is still happening, and we posted about that Mm -hmm. on our Facebook page. There is a a new chronology you can take a look at. It has not stopped. We still want to know, why is Chicago the focus of all the Mothman sightings? Some people think it's some type of a publicity stunt for an upcoming film. I don't think so. I think this is a real deal. We just don't know why Mothman's there yet, but maybe we'll find out soon. It's a it's a very interesting cryptid, yes, Mothman. Yes, it is. Yeah, with a long history. So take a look there. Make sure you give us a like and follow us. And also, a couple of announcements. Ezra from the org. He's running a big sale, 20% off all of his CBD oil products. Oh, cool. So take a look. You can save a little money and go visit him at thehighend.org. And also, we have Tom Palladino's Scalar Energy Treatments at creativestrength.us. Go there. You will get 15 days of free Scalar Treatment. You don't have to give a credit card. You don't have to do anything except send him your photograph. You will get a free 15-day Scalar treatment very cool stuff don't miss Mm -hmm. it hey it's free right yes what do you have to lose (laughs) go for it not a thing except some pain (laughs) yeah get rid of that pain we don't want to see you in pain anymore any of you so tonight we're blessed because we have Mark O'Connell, who is the author of this tremendous book, The Close Encounters Man, How One Man Made the World Believe in UFOs. So let me tell you a little bit about Mark. 
He's a serious writer. He is a screenwriter, teacher, and blogger. He wrote episodes for Star Trek, yes, one of our favorite shows, The Next Generation, (laughs) and Star Trek Deep Space Nine. He's developed feature film projects with major studios, including Walt Disney and DreamWorks Animation. And he is also the founder of the UFO blog, where you can read his writings now in, in our time. High Strangeness is the name of it. He lives in Wisconsin with his wife, Monica, and teaches screenwriting at DePaul University in Chicago. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. Hey, it's terrific to have you. Tremendous book. You said it took you five years of your life to write this. Pretty much, yeah. If you add up all the research years, it's, yeah, it was it was a big chunk of my life. <laughs> Wow. Well, it is it is a great, great book and yes. it's it just it really it's so well written. I mean we were just pulled into the life of J. Allen Hynek and you know, PK and I read a lot of books. We have to for the show. We love to read. But your book was tremendous. Really Thank you page. so much. Very yeah, good it's indeed. Great. It's great. So tell us. I know you've told the story before, but our audience needs to hear it directly from you. Mm-hmm. What brought you to J. Allen Hynek's door? What was it? It's it was it was a long, long route <laughs> that got me to J. <laughs> Allen Hynek's door. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been fascinated by UFOs and aliens and outer space since I was a, a tiny kid. My first conscious memory was when I was about three and a half years old. That. Um, a new, a new scary science fiction show was on TV called The Outer Limits. <laughs> yes. And for some, stra- well. <laughs> for some strange reason, my mom tuned in the pilot episode of The Outer Limits, and, when the, and, and there was always a scary monster in every episode of that show. So in the premiere episode, this glowing alien appears, scared me to death and i remember running up <laughs> running upstairs and hiding around the corner and telling my mom i wouldn't come back downstairs until that scary monster was gone so that that kind of set the tone for my life i've been fascinating in those fascinated in those things uh ever since then and and uh i kind of kind of got away from all that i was just i was obsessed with ufos and the paranormal you know in my teens and in my 20s kind of fell away from it you know had kids raised a family did more serious stuff but but just in the last few years kind of got interested in it again and started writing my blog high strangeness and um you know when you write a blog i'm sure it's the same as doing a podcast you have this constant need for new material mm-hmm. so um yeah. i was so, yeah, so I was always online uh, looking for new, interesting um, things going on in the in UFO world to write about, and I came across um, the website for J. Allen Hynek's Center for UFO Studies in Chicago. Well, I was living in Chicago part-time at the time. This is like 2011, and could not believe my luck that I had found this UFO research center just a couple of miles from where I lived. So I got in touch, and Mark Rodiger, who's the scientific director at KUFOS now, invited me to come over. It turns out all that's left of KUFOS today is a bunch of files in a couple people's basements in Chicago. Oh, how sad. It, it is. It is. So I, went to, so I went to Mark Rodiger's house, and he gave me you know, free reign. And I, I started visiting there every couple of months just to poke around in their files. They had so much interesting stuff. And I, got, I was sort of reintroduced to J. Allen Hynek while I dug through those files. Well, on one of those visits, Mark just kind of casually mentioned, oh, by the way, we've always wanted to find a writer to do the definitive um, telling of Dr. Heinrich's career. And I said, hey, let me, (laughs) I want to do it. Please pick me. So he said, sure, (laughs) here you go. You have access to our files. Go for it. And that's, that's kind of how it all happened. I was, I was kind of in the right place at the right time. Or as Heineck liked to say, Heineck liked to call himself an innocent bystander where UFOs were concerned. (laughs) I guess that applies to me as well. Oh, that's great. That's great. Now, you've done a, just an incredible job, as I mentioned, with this book. But what was the most surprising thing 
about the research that you delved into to to, uh, to report all of this about Jay Allen Hunt. What surprised you the most about him and his journey? I, I think it has to be the this dichotomy between his scientific endeavors and his pursuit of 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 these mysteries in the world that was that was something i wasn't really expecting i wasn't really prepared for and i didn't really start to learn about it until i started digging through the files across town at northwestern university in evanston where dr heineck taught for 25 years so when i start so here i'm i'm digging through all of his ufo archives at at in mark rodiger's basement and then across town i'm digging into his professional files as a professional astronomer and academic uh, educator at Northwestern and I started to learn how he juggled these two careers mm -hmm. and how the how the two careers really kind of informed each other over time and I'd say that was the biggest surprise was that his mm -hmm. what, you know th these things that I thought he would have kept you know completely separate in his life n not at all they were very much uh, they were very much intertwined in everything he did throughout his career and that i found i found really fascinating and i was so impressed by dr heinick's accomplishments as an astronomer things that i had never ever realized he was a pioneer in the field of celestial imaging he literally paved the way for the hubble space telescope um, he identified a record number of supernovae Wow. Uh, yeah, he he had a huge, huge list of accomplishments as an astronomer that I had never heard of before. Mm -hmm. And and another part of that surprising discovery of his life was the fact that he had such a deep um, spiritual side. I don't know if that's how he would have described it, because he was, as his son Paul told me, he was not religious at all. They were not a religious family. But his dad was really fascinated, going back to his youth, back to his high school years. His dad was fascinated by um, the Rosicrucians, uh, the teachings of Rudolf Steiner. Uh, oh. he really, yeah, he really, really got into that stuff in his early years. And then, and then um, when, when it came to his end of life in his last year, mm -hmm. uh, when he was uh, dying of brain cancer then he sort of came full circle and started to immerse himself in those spiritual um the spiritual themes once again so th those were the big surprises for me and you know they really fleshed him out as a person all of a sudden he's this really fascinating three-dimensional person with you know conflicting beliefs sometimes and conflicting motivations and mm -hmm. you know he was a, he was a complicated guy pk i thought it was really interesting in your your numerology reading how you talked about how he um he took shortcuts sometimes yes the first thing i thought of when you said that was the infamous swamp gas case <laughs> which which i'm pretty sure we'll talk about tonight right when he, when, yes when, yes when let's Heine talk about it when Heineck said swamp gas at this, that press conference to explain mm -hmm. these sightings, I think you could say that he was he was kind of taking a shortcut there. I do believe, I honestly believe that he said the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I, I go into a lot of detail in the book. That story is so complicated that it actually took two chapters for me to tell the story adequately, and I still had to leave some things out. Um, but I thought it was interesting when you said that, though, because I thought that really does apply to that, mm -hmm. to that, absolutely to that particular case. He lived in his head a tremendous amount of time. Yeah. It, it, people, he was multidimensional, yet mm -hmm. he closed down those doors as he, it was kind of walking down a hallway. He kept closing the door right behind him. And it wasn't until he came back he could pick it up again. Mm. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting insight. I mean, he was a fantastic communicator. Yes, he did mm -hmm. live inside his head a lot, um, and he and he wasn't always the most communicative person. But when he needed to, he re, you know he could be a really fantastic, mm -hmm. persuasive writer and speaker. Mm. Very interesting. Well. Yes, so you want to talk about the swamp gas case. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> Give us the, kind... the bones of that one. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. Um, a lot of people, when I when I do interviews and things, a lot of people, one of the first things they'll ask me is, what was the moment at which Dr. Heine changed his mind about UFOs? You know, because I think that's probably the thing that most people know of 
when they if they know if they know much at all about Dr. Heineck, they know that they're you know he had this really interesting career trajectory where he started out debunking UFO reports for the Air Force, and then over time became what people sometimes say is a true believer. That's probably not the most accurate term, but he became open-minded about the UFO phenomenon mm-hmm. and, and really felt that it deserved some serious study. So the swamp gas case sort of fits into that whole trajectory because it was the moment at which he kind of completed his turnabout on how he felt about the UFO phenomenon. So March 1966, the American public already has UFO fever because this best-selling book, The Incident in Exeter, was being was being excerpted in popular magazines. People were very excited about UFOs, and they were the American public was really ready for a huge UFO event. And so, in March of '66, in in southeastern Michigan, there was just this whole series of UFO sightings. It really took place over a couple of weeks, and it involved law enforcement officers chasing UFOs at night in their squad cars. And then it kind of reached its peak one night when. Um, some UFOs appeared in the swampland next to a farmhouse. And the family living in this farmhouse, they see these lights floating around down near the marsh, and they go tracking them, and the family calls in the police. So all the police, they're already into it because they've all been seeing UFOs for the previous week. <laughs> so they, they're they all excited. They show up at the farm, and everybody everybody's seeing it. Everybody's seeing these glowing lights. And they're bobbing up and down, and they're moving around, and they'll disappear from one spot and then instantly reappear in another spot. And then the next night it all happens again at a a college in Hillsdale where 87 young women living in a dormitory overlooking the campus arboretum all see the exact same thing. They see these same glowing lights that are floating up and down and moving around and disappearing and reappearing. And these UFO sightings just make national headlines. It's a huge, hugely popular story. And so the Air Force has no choice but to send Heineck in to investigate because, really, they just want to squash this story. It's a, oh, yeah. you know, every, every time there was an unexplained UFO incident, it was an embarrassment to the Air Force because they're supposed to be able to explain these things, and they couldn't. All right. So they send Heineck in, and by mm-hmm. the time Heineck gets there, it's just a complete carnival. It's a media circus. There are reporters from all over the country hounding this farm family and the college students, and Heineck shows up, and he's trying his best to make sense of what's going on. And um, and he quickly starts to realize that uh, even though there's sort of a general agreement among all the witnesses about the lights they saw, there's not a whole lot of agreement between any of them about what exactly they were looking at, about whether it had a solid form or a shape or whether it actually flew in from a distance and appeared in the, and landed in the swamp or if it just appeared there spontaneously. So over three days of interviewing, a, a, over, gosh, I can't even remember the, the total amount, but he interviewed a whole lot of people in Michigan over three days. And he made this very fateful decision. He said, you know what? I'm only going to stick with the facts that two or more people can agree on. If only one person says they saw it, I'm just going to leave that out of my investigation. So that was a pretty fateful decision. And then when he goes to the college to interview these 87 students who saw these lights in the Arboretum, well, shocker, the dorm house mother says, you know what, I'm very protective of these girls. I'm only going to let you talk to two of them. So instead of talking to 87 witnesses, he only gets to talk to two witnesses. And while he's at the campus interviewing interviewing these young women, he also meets with the county civil defense agent who was there the night of the sightings. And the county civil defense agent says, you know what? When I first saw those lights in the swamp, I thought it was swamp gas. So right off the bat, someone has planted this idea in Heineck's head. That it might have been, it might have been swamp gas, and over the course of the following three days, and unfortunately, this is a this was a part of the story that was it was too lengthy to to fit in the book, so we so we had to edit it. But over the course of three days, no less than six different people 
suggest to Heineck that it might have been swamp gas. It sounds like swamp gas. So when the Air Force forces Heineck three days later to hold a press conference in Detroit and explain to the world what these people saw in Michigan, he gets up to the microphone and he says, he words it very carefully. He says, I can't prove it in a court of law, but everything these witnesses have described sounds like swamp gas. Okay, so he so he didn't absolutely say, yes, they saw swamp gas and I can prove it. You know, right. he was very careful in the way he worded it. But that didn't matter. Everybody thought that he was saying swamp gas is the explanation, and that's what right. stuck. All these reporters ran to their telephones, and they didn't listen to another word Heineck had to say because he had already said what they wanted to hear. And Heineck beat it out of town because everybody was furious with him because, you know, everybody in the state of Michigan thought that the the Air Force's top UFO expert had just called them all a bunch of kooks. Right? And, they were, and they were furious <laughs> with Heineck. Yeah, yeah and, but the thing right. is... As you know, as fantastic as the case was, and as as and it's really it's one of the most thoroughly documented UFO cases in history, just simply because emotions were so running so high. But I really truly believe, and this doesn't ma- this makes a lot of UFO uh, enthusiasts disappointed or angry with me. But I truly believe that Heineck said the right thing at that press conference. He couldn't prove it in a court of law, but there was a very strong chance that they were actually looking at swamp gas because that's what swamp gas does. It it forms sort of a glowing bubble that floats in the air, and it moves up and down, and it moves from side to side, and sometimes it poofs out of existence, and it reappears on the other side of the swamp. So I think Heineck was right in saying that's what this could have been. Right. It's just that he also didn't say, or it could be this. And <laughs> you're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> he would have had a faster trip out of town. So he yeah. into a I mean, he was such a Debbie Downer with that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was. He was. He, he was, just but... didn't give us anything more than swamp gas. My gosh. But there, but, but, yeah. but here's the here's the really interesting thing about that about that that case though is that. Um, so after he after he became public enemy number one by saying swamp gas, <laughs> he he goes. I mean, you know, really, he was hated. Everybody hated him. Everybody was furious with him, including all his buddies back in Illinois. His his colleague Jacques Vallée was 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 furious with Heineck for for saying swamp gas. Really? Oh, yeah. okay. But but the interesting thing is, and I, I discovered this going through these 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 archives in at Northwestern University. You go through his correspondence files, and after the swamp gas incident, he gets dozens and dozens and maybe hundreds of letters from people all over the world. All of a sudden, he is a legitimate UFO superstar because of the swamp gas incident, of all things. This this (laughs) event that made him so unpopular suddenly, like, ricochets. And he's becoming incredibly popular. He's getting speaking engagements. His files are full of letters from fans all over the world who are saying, please tell me more about UFOs. Or in many cases, the letters are saying, I would like to tell you about my UFO experience. And then they'll go on for 10 or 20 pages explaining this UFO experience they had. So that's the weird thing about the swamp gas case in Michigan. That case turned Heineck into the most popular UFO figure of all time. Everybody that wanted so to talk strange. to Hel- Alan Heine. Yeah, I still can't figure it out. Yeah, it's that's the exact a weird opposite one. response you would expect. It is exact opposite. It must have been something to do, PK, with his personal year and whatever was going on with that at the time. We'll have to take a look at that, maybe on well, the break. I think one of the things, if you think about it, the more we say it doesn't exist or play it down, the more people want to believe that, aha, uh-huh, you're hiding something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really well, good point. Mm-hmm. Yes, and that's one of the questions. You know, I certainly uh, I've I've known of Heineck. Some of my friends knew him, and it's I always wondered was he a guy with a white hat or a black hat or something in <laughs> between? You know, uh-huh. and so uh, but your book really put a lot of things into perspective 
for this. True. So we're going to get the other thing about your book that we love so much is all the wonderful cases that you talk yes. about. And we want to get to more of those because you've got some great cases in there uh, that we have to get to tonight. So I know our listeners are dying to hear about all of them. Great. And, hey, guys, you're just going to have to get the book if you want to read them all, but they're all terrific. <laughs> For sure. So, again, we are speaking tonight with Mark O'Connell. He is the author of The Close Encounters Man, How One Man Made the World Believe in UFOs. You're listening to Supernatural Girls Radio. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I'm here with my co-host, numerologist PK, and our incredible guest tonight, Mark O'Connell. He is the author of a terrific book, The Close Encounters Man. We've got a couple of questions for you, Mark, from the chat room, so I'm just going to go through those before we get on to some of those fabulous UFO cases that you've written about. This one is from Heineck Fan, and he says, Hello, what did the faculty at the university he worked at think about his interest in UFOs? <laughs> That's a great question. Heineck had a, Heineck had a very complicated relationship <laughs> with the people he worked with at Northwestern. You know, he spent like the first half of his career teaching at the Ohio State University and Ohio Westland. And that was kind of at the beginning of his UFO career, so there was never much clash there. But when he taught at Northwestern from 1960 to about 1984, um, there were there were some clashes. The university the university was very happy to sort of bask in the glow of Heineck's fame, but at the same time, they did not like it when anybody thought that the university was sort of sponsoring or even bankrolling Heineck's UFO research. They were very much against anyone thinking that. So so Northwestern would sort of keep Heineck at arm's length, and then they would sort of hug him close when he got famous. It was kind of interesting, and as far as his colleagues, as you know, as far as his his fellow professors, uh, he did he did mention at one point. And I, I have that quote in the book where he he said that you know most most of my colleagues think I'm a nut. He was he was very blunt about that, but he also surrounded himself at Northwestern. He also surrounded himself with sort of this core of um, you know loyal loyal colleagues like Dr. Jacques Vallée. And like Bill Powers, yes. um, who spent a lot of time with Heineck at the Dearborn Observatory, and they would, uh, you know, when they were done with their official work for Northwestern, they would, you know, sometimes put in a few hours looking at new UFO reports from Project Blue Book, or just, you know, talking about UFOs in general. And that sort of formed the core of the famous Invisible College that Dr. Vallee wrote his book about. So, so yeah, right. so Heineck, so he, you know, he kind of had to be careful what he said or did in public for fear of, you know, getting the, getting his superiors at Northwestern upset with him. But, but sometimes, you know, sometimes he crossed that line anyway. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, it's a, um, it's a, it is a great question by Heineck fan because we have had people on the show that have had their careers either interrupted or downgraded because they were involved in the UFO phenomenon. So some of them, like Leo Sprinkle, uh, could never get full professorship because of their involvement. They always remained associate professors and things like that, which is a real shame. So I'm glad that didn't happen to Heineck, but it sounds like he knew how to manage these people. So. <laughs> I think he really did. He did. Oh, yes. Here's another question for you. This is from Starlight. I'd like to know whether the resident in that town supported the family who – we're talking about the swamp gas story. Oh, right. Um, supported the family who reported the swamp gas or if they didn't want the government attention in their town. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I think it's I think it's probably safe to say that nobody really wanted all that government attention. Um, but you know, it's a fine line because they were excited, you know, on the one hand they were excited that the Air Force sent Heineck to talk to them and to and to investigate their sightings because you know, when the government sends their top UFO expert out to investigate your sighting, that kind of says something. They're saying, well, we think something really significant may have happened here. Mm-hmm. 
But at the same time, then, because because the way the government approached these things was sometimes so clumsy and sometimes so even hypocritical that they would very often rub the witnesses the wrong way and make the witnesses wish that the Air Force had never shown up. So, for instance, in the case of the Michigan swamp gas uh, sightings, Project Blue Book actually sent, they sent Hynek, but they also sent uh, a couple of their military guys who, you know, Hynek would talk to these people and the military guys would talk to those people. And... Sometimes their paths would cross and their research would overlap, but it had to have, it had to have been pretty maddening for these witnesses to have, you know, well, here's Heineck talking to me, and Heineck is, you know, pretty open-minded, and he, he seems to be, you know, really open to what I'm telling him, and then on the other hand, they'd be interviewed by these military people who would just be, you know, very, very um, short with them and, and, you know, and often belittle them. So it was kind of a weird dynamic. Yes, absolutely. And and off um, off the air, we were talking about how Dr. Hynek really did stand up for people who had, had seen these things. He didn't feel that people should be ridiculed. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because that's a really standout characteristic that this man had very ahead right. of his time. I agree. It was it was one of his real strengths, and it emerged very very early on. He started working for the Air Force in nineteen. 19- in 1948, 1949 time frame. And in 1952, just a couple of years later, he was actually giving an address to a, a group of professional scientists at their convention. And that was the first time he said that ridicule is not part of the scientific method and the American public should not be taught that it is. And he truly believed that. Right. He really felt, once he, once he a- actually started going out in the field and investigating UFO cases and really having some face time with UFO witnesses, he really learned to value the human factor and to respect the human factor. So to him, it was a really, really important part of UFO research that the witnesses had to be treated with respect. You needed to listen to what they had to say. You needed to put some thought into it and give them a proper response. Now, obviously, you know, what we said before about the Michigan swamp gas case, people believed he hadn't done those things, you know, right. and, and it's easy it's easy to see why they felt that way. So I guess you could say that case was maybe an aberration in the way Heineck approached things. But by and large, throughout his career, you know, one of his number one prime, his prime directive was to treat witnesses with respect and, mm-hmm. and, and really honor and respect their experience. Which is tremendous. That's why I think we have to give him the white hat, you know, that he was yeah. a good guy yeah. in, in what he did. That, that's that's tremendous. Now, let's talk about some of these amazing cases that you have in the book, because they're great to read. Yes, You've done an excellent are. job writing about them. Talk to us about your favorite case. Well, first of all, thank you for the compliment. That was one of my big worries going into this book, was I realized there has already, with some of these really high-profile UFO cases, there has already been so much written about them by so many different people. How could I possibly tell these same stories again in a new way and make them feel, you know, fresh and new? So I appreciate the fact that that they read that way to you. Hey, yes, you did it. Did. Yes. Uh, thanks. Great that's job. that's that's a huge yes. compliment. That makes me feel good. So, but one of those big cases was um, the 1973 abduction of Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker in Pascagoula, Mississippi. This was always a, a a big big case for me because, as I mentioned early in our in the show, um, you know, I, I sort of got exposed to science fiction and aliens very very early in life. And then as I was growing up, I would read every kind of UFO and paranormal book I could get my hands on. Uh, And then 1973, October 1973, I would have been 13 years old at the time. Suddenly this UFO abduction case makes national headlines. It's on the TV news. It's on the radio. It's in the newspapers. And for me as a 13-year-old, up to that point, my only involvement with the UFO phenomenon had been what I read in books that I got at the library or magazines or, you know, whatever I could lay my hands on. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, here's a real UFO event, and it's a it's a big event, yes. and, it's, and they're talking about it on the news. They're talking about it on TV and on the radio. So for the first time, I'm, like, experiencing a real 
UFO event. It's not just a story. <laughs> it's real. It's happening. So, it's happening. <laughs> so, so these two, these two guys, um, Calvin Parker and Charlie Hickson, they're out fishing one night in Pascagoula, Mississippi, and this glowing blue object, ten or twenty, ten or thirty feet feet uh, in length and, and ten or twenty feet high approaches them from across the bayou and it's flashing these blue lights and it comes close to them and hovers near them and these two guys are just paralyzed in fright and then suddenly a door opens in the side of this object and these three creatures come floating out not walking out but floating out and they're the creepiest sounding things imaginable they're humanoid but they have lobster claws instead of hands and they have like round stumps at the bottoms of their legs instead of feet and they've got they've got like pointy cones for, no, for nose and ears and little slits for eyes just really really strange creatures that almost sound like robots these guys thought that they were being kidnapped by robots and so they get carried on board this ship they go through the door they go into the ship they're separated kelvin kelvin parker just passes out while he's being while he's being taken on board the ship. So he doesn't remember anything, at least not right away. Mm -hmm. But Charles Hickson remembers everything. He was examined by these creatures. He was left alone for a while. He was just scared to death. And after about maybe 20 minutes or so, to his best guess, they take him back out and they leave him back on the pier where they found him. And by this time, Calvin has already been left on the pier and calvin is like going into shock charlie has to slap him a couple times <laughs> to get to you know to get him to stop crying and you know kind of get oh, a grip on gosh. so they call the sheriff and this is one of the really amazing parts of this story they call the sheriff first of all they're terrified to call the sheriff because they know they're going to be made fun of <laughs> that yes. yeah yeah but then they realize and this is such a human thing they start thinking well wait a minute what if that thing is still out there somewhere? What if those creatures are going to kidnap other people tonight? We can't let that happen. Yes. So they're driven by this really like brave <clears throat> sense of duty to protect their fellow man. And they, you know, they bite the bullet. They call the sheriff and the sheriff and his deputies are actually pretty respectful of them. But what they do is so the sheriff, so they separate the two guys, separate rooms. They get, they get, uh, you know, they get the report of what happened from each of these two guys, and their stories match perfectly. And then what the sheriff does is he pulls a little trick on on Calvin and Charlie. He puts them back in the same room together and leaves them alone for a few minutes. And what Calvin and Charlie don't know is that the sheriff left a running tape recorder in that room uh -huh. because he because he thought. He thought that these guys might be pulling his leg, and he thought, well, if we leave them alone, <laughs> if we leave them alone, they'll admit that they're hoaxing this whole thing, and they'll, they'll just be patting each other on the back for pulling off such a great joke. Well, what he gets is the exact opposite. These two guys are scared out of their wits. They're going crazy sitting at the sheriff's office. They, they, they just want to get out of there. They want to have a drink. They're afraid they'll never be able to sleep again. It's a terrifying conversation, and it really, it, I don't know if you could technically call it proof, but it's very strong evidence that these two men had an incredibly intense experience that really, really scarred them. So the sheriff gets this tape recording of this conversation and thinks, wow, maybe something real happened. So by the next day, people are worried enough that they take these two guys to the local Air Force Base to have them check for radiation. Well, they, the tests come out negative, thank God. But in the meantime, it, it, again, it's picked up national headlines. It's become a huge, huge case. Dr. Hynek at this point is actually working for NBC News because they were going to make a, a documentary about the UFO uh, phenomenon. So NBC sends Dr. Hynek down to Pascagoula, Mississippi. He meets with Calvin and Charlie. He hears that tape recording that the sheriff made in secret, which he finds very, very convincing. He sits in a room while, um, while a psychiatrist attempts to hypnotize the two men. And he's able to hypnotize them, but when he gets them both to the part where the weird object appears over the over the water, mm -hmm. both men go into a pure panic and they can't continue. So they have to be taken out of hypnosis for fear that 
you know, they might encounter some kind of psychic damage. So Heineck walks out of that room so impressed with these two guys. Their stories remain consistent. Their terror under hypnosis was impossible to fake. And then there's that secret tape recording that the sheriff made in which these two guys had, you know, that was a perfect all opportunity for, yeah, all the, all the elements, they all stacked up to make this a really, really convincing case to Heineck. And it's why it's one of my favorite cases. Yeah, it, it is a great case. I mean, you, you're right. And it's really tough to fake that kind of panic and terror and those poor guys and what they yeah. went through. I mean, and I, there was... Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I had the good fortune to interview uh, Joe Kalingo, who was the local attorney who represented Charlie and Calvin. Um, and he had some really interesting, interesting things to say. He worked, he worked very closely with these guys in the aftermath of, of their abduction. And he told me, he told me they never gave me any reason to doubt their story. He said, I didn't think they were crazy, but people thought I was crazy for not thinking they were crazy. <laughs> and he, and he stood by them and he defended them, you know, he defended them to the last. And he, and he, he was also there when they actually had a polygraph test. Now, only only Charlie had the polygraph test because Kelvin had a nervous breakdown like that mm. day, oh, wow. and he had to be institutionalized. So, so mm. um, Charlie Hickson undergoes the polygraph test, and the polygraph operator comes out and he says, and he says, "I'm not saying he saw a spaceship, but when he said he saw a spaceship, he wasn't lying." So, you know, how much proof do you Very need? Important. I you know, know how, how much it. evidence Gosh. do you need that something real happened here? And Heineck, Heineck just maintained to the end, something real happened to these two men. I don't know what it was, but mm -hmm. it was real. He had no doubt and that it was real. Now, with Heineck interviewing them and hearing that uh, secret tape and all of that, was that kind of a, a turning point for Heineck or a cementing of Heineck's Understanding that this was, a, you know, these things are real. These things are happening. The place where it took him from skeptic to at least we could call it kind of like a believer, I guess. Yeah. Well, he had already made that journey. He had already gotten by the by the outs the outcome of the swamp gas case. He had pretty thoroughly changed his mind and decided that this was a real phenomenon and it was worthy of scientific study. But you do make a good point, though, because what happened after that Pascagoula event with Charlie and Calvin being abducted by the strange claw, claw man, that changed Heineck's mind about close encounters of the third kind, which, hmm. as we all know, that's a close encounter that involves some sort of entity or creature associated with the UFO. So even though by 1966, Heineck was pretty accepting that this was a real phenomenon, that these things really were appearing in the sky and that people who saw them weren't nuts, he still had a ways to go with close encounters of the third kind. They still made him uncomfortable because they just went into this realm of things that not only could you not explain it, but there may not exist any sort of rational explanation at all that you could ever reach. So he was just really uncomfortable with that. But what happened was right around this, right around this time frame, he had gone, to, he had just gone to Papua New Guinea and met with Father Gill, who had had this bizarre close encounter of the third kind in 1959, where he waved to these UFO occupants and they yes, waved back. Yes, I love that. Yeah. I, I, so, so Heineken that was just. Amazing. Yeah, Heineck had just come back from New Guinea just before the Pascagoula case. So he's already thinking, wow, this priest in New Guinea was, was a very convincing witness. I really believe he saw something. Within a matter of a couple of weeks, he's down in Mississippi interviewing these two men who said they were abducted by these, these claw men onto this flying saucer. And by this time, Heineck's ready to start thinking, Okay, maybe I need to be more open-minded about these about these alien encounters too. Yeah, I mean it's it's an interesting evolution for him. And one of the things that surprised me, Mark, in your book was the fact that Heineck was also considering the possibility that these entities that were coming into our airspace may be extra-dimensional. I was surprised to hear that. Fascinating. 
Yeah, isn't isn't that wild? He um Yes. He yeah, he he really became um I guess you could almost say fixated on that concept in later in his later years. He really thought that I mean he was he was always open to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Right. But he always but he always said if you're going to try to if you're going to try to push that hypothesis then the burden is on you to prove it. And obviously nobody has been able to prove that at, up to this day. But Heineck was equally open to the idea of an extra dimensional hypothesis. He actually called it um metaterrestrial, which I thought was which I thought mm. was a great term. That so is. so but one of the thing that's interesting to me about this this sort of this route that his mind started taking was that it really goes right back to his fascination as as a high school and college student with the Rosicrucians and with Rudolf Steiner, because Rudolf Steiner taught that there was something he called a, a um, the super sensible realm. That's one of my favorite terms now, the super <laughs> sensible realm, which is this parallel dimension that exists alongside ours, in which living beings live, and Steiner felt that not only was this dimension real, but we could train ourselves with enough training and discipline. We could, we could teach ourselves how to go into that super sensible realm and then come back into our own world. So these are Heineck's, you know, these are the ideas that Heineck was to- toying with in his teenage years, in his early 20s. And all of a sudden in later life, he finds a way to sort of use that same concept as a possible explanation for the UFO phenomenon. Yes. I found that, I found that really fascinating. That, so the parallel dimension thing really, really looms large in, in Heineck's mm-hmm. thinking later in life. That, that is so surprising to me. I mean, we've had people on the show that have talked about this, and but it's, you know, we thought it was a fairly new concept to be discussed, but now... You know, we're finding out Heineck thought about this many, many years ago and included it in his, some of his explanations. So it's, it's very, it's fascinating that all of this is in your book. Mm-hmm. So, okay, here oh. is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, there, there are some, there are some other interesting aspects to that whole, the, the, the meta terrestrial idea. Um, Oh gosh! Now <laughs> we should probably go to the question because I lost my train of thought. Uh, that's I'm all right. Sorry. Okay, we're going to go to. Ah, that have, I am having a. We're testing moment. you. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, we're going to take this question quickly, and then we're going to go to a break. Okay. This is from Trisha. Hi. Does Heineck's personal memo ex- memos express his professional or official theory on the Roswell UFO crash before he received fame in the '60s? Ah, uh, we always have to deal with Roswell, don't we? Uh, can't get rid of it. <laughs> Heineck, Heineck was not a big fan. I have to be honest. Heineck was not a big fan of of Roswell or of any saucer crash stories. And a big mm-hmm. reason for that was, if you start thinking in terms of a flying saucer crashing into Earth, that suggests that the flying saucer, the UFO, was a physical structure that was manufactured by someone, what some people will call the nuts and bolts, the nuts and bolts hypothesis. Um, and Heineck was never comfortable with that. In fact, oh, this is the point I wanted to make before where I just lost my train of thought. It actually plays into this Okay, wait, question. wait, you're going to have to hold on to All that. Right, well, wait, I'll hold that thought till after the, till after the break. I'll yeah, hold that thought. Hold that thought, and we are going to come back. Yes, you better remember. All right. <laughs> okay, so everybody, we are going to come back and have the rest of our conversation with Mark O'Connell. He is the author of The Close Encounters Man. We're going to talk about Close Encounters and those classifications. Steven Spielberg, and so much more. So stay tuned, everybody. You are listening to Supernatural Girls Radio. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I'm here with PK, my co-host, and our tremendous guest tonight. We're having so much fun with him. Oh, God, Mark. yes. <laughs> oh, God. He is here. And now we're going to get back to that train of thought that you picked up. Right. At the end of the last segment. So tell us, tell us, tell us. What's up? Going to pull it all together here. All, all together. right. 
Well, Trisha's question was about Roswell, and I was I was making the case that Dr. Hynek was not fond of saucer crash stories because they implied that the UFO was a was a solid manufactured object, and Dr. Hynek was never really comfortable with that concept. He he thought it was possible, but he was never com- comfortable with you know fully endorsing that. So, but what that what that reminded me of was the previous question about Hynek's parallel dimension thinking one of one of the ideas that he had along the lines of the of the parallel dimension theory was he would he would point out look unidentified objects behave sometimes they behave like solid objects sometimes they behave like immaterial objects it's the very same object. It can be photographed. You can throw a, a rock at it. You can shoot a gun at it. You can. It can leave landing marks or scorched earth or scorched bushes. So it behaves very much like a physical object. And then suddenly it will vanish. It will seem to dematerialize as if it was not a physical object. So Heineck would compare that to the characteristics of light, which has always puzzled scientists. It behaves like a particle. And it behaves like a wave. How do you explain that? It can't be both, and yet somehow it appears to be both. So Heineck would apply that. Heineck made the that use that analogy um, to explain this sort of unreality of UFOs: the fact that they mm. can they can seem like physical objects one moment, and then seem like immaterial objects the next. And that was one of his kind of supporting arguments for the parallel dimension theory. Mm-hmm. Yes, well, that makes sense. I mean, I can understand where he would come up with that. But now, he was the person who came up with the term close encounters and the classifications, right? Yes. And yet, Steven Spielberg kind of stole it from him, didn't he? Uh, Yeah, it was, was, uh, (laughs) let's say it was inadvertent. (laughs) <laughs> One of, this came. This came. This right, came I'm trying sure. to. I'm being. I'm being the diplomatic here. Yes, you sure are. This, this came. This came up early on in my research. So, so I'm. I'm in Mark Rodiger's basement, and I'm looking through the Kufos files, and I'm. I reach the letter S, and I find two files. One is labeled Sagan, and the other is labeled Spielberg. So, of course, I grab both of those files, and I start looking through the Spielberg one first. And the first thing I find in the Spielberg file, there are only three or four sheets of paper in the Spielberg file. It's very thin. But the first paper I find is a copy of a letter that Dr. Hynek had written to Steven Spielberg um, when he found out that Mr. Spielberg had appropriated his term Close Encounters of the Third Kind as the title of this new UFO movie he was shooting. So Hynek... Very, Heineck was also very diplomatic. He wrote this very, it's, it's almost awkwardly polite letter that he wrote to Steven Spielberg, sort of saying, um, you know that title of this movie you're making? That's mine. We should talk. So, <laughs> so, so the next piece of paper in this file is the return letter from Steven Spielberg. A week or two later, Steven Spielberg writes back to Dr. Heineck and says, oh, I'm so sorry, but don't worry, that's not what we're calling the movie. We're calling it Watch the Skies. But he said, I just want... Yeah, but he said, but Spielberg said, but I want you to know that your book... This, this is he's referring to the book, the UFO experience, in which Heineck sort of, you know, introduced these concepts of the close encounters. So Spielberg says, but I want you to know that your book, the UFO experience, is required reading for everybody on the movie crew. I want everybody on my creative staff to, you know, to understand your work. So, and of course, Watch the Skies also comes from another source. It's an immortal line of dialogue from the 1951 movie, The Thing, from Another World. But at the end of the movie, when the reporter warns the world, watch the skies, watch the skies. So, well, of course, we know that the title got switched back to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It sure did. Spielberg and Heineck, they worked it all out. They were both grown-ups. They worked it out, and um, Heineck signed on as technical consultant to the movie. They, uh, Spielberg and his production company uh, paid Heineck for the rights to use the title and for the rights to um, adapt any of the stories that were told in the book, The UFO Experience. And then they hired him on for three days on set as a technical consultant. And then, of course, as as 
and many of us know, that le- led to a six-second cameo scene <laughs> at the climax right. of the movie when the yeah. mothership, the mothership has just descended over the UFO landing site, and all the technicians are sort of hanging back out of fear of this gigantic glowing mothership, and here's this guy in his, you know, his tweed sport coat marching purposely forward through all these technicians, marching towards the mothership while everybody else is hanging back. And it's J. Allen Hynek, and he, he strokes his goatee, and he fiddles with his pipe and then sticks it in his mouth. And then he, you know, he stares in wonder at this magnificent mothership. So that was Hynek's movie career. That was his six-second role in the movie. Incredible. What a highlight. And yet I, I did hear uh, from one of your other interviews that there was also some other footage shot, but it ended up on the cutting room floor. <laughs> Probably good that it did because it sounded really hokey, huh? <laughs> yeah, Heineck thought it was pretty corny. I guess they must have had some time to kill on the set or something. Because, <laughs> because so in the, in the movie, in the, in the movie as it exists now, we never see Heineck in the same shot with the alien creatures. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, what happened was the day they shot Heineck's cameo scene, they actually did shoot a couple scenes with Heineck interacting with the aliens. So he described how um, they had Spielberg had Heineck get down on his knees because the aliens were you know pretty short. So he got down on his knees and sort of allowed the little aliens to play with him. And he said they would tug at his goatee. And one of the aliens grabbed his pipe and stuck it up his nose, not Heineck's nose, stuck it up his own alien nose. <laughs> oh, so, th- so there was all sorts, there was all sorts of just goofy business going on with the pipe and, and the goatee. Oh, and, you know, if Spielberg had wanted to, he could have included those scenes in the movie and it would have been, it would have been a good moment of, of uh, humor, but it probably wouldn't have played well. It would have kind of ruined the mood yeah. of this yes. dramatic scene. So Heineck yeah, was, I think so. Heineck yeah. enjoyed shooting the scenes, but he was very, very grateful that they hadn't been included in the movie. Yeah, that's good. I agree with that. Incredible. So now, one of the things that really, I think, turned Heineck around in with what you wrote about in the book are all of the military people, the pilots especially, who saw UFOs and reported them. He, he was unable to dismiss their accounts, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, there were, yeah, there were certain things, certain things that Heineck would look for in a case that he always found convincing. I, I had mentioned a few minutes ago how he was, he was always a little uneasy with the close encounters of the third kind cases involving mm-hmm. alien, alien entities, even though those were often the most dramatic and, you know, got the big headlines. The close encounters of the second kind were the cases that Heineck really, really gravitated towards because he he felt that they offered the most scientific evidence for study so that would include say a visual radar sighting somebody somebody sees a ufo from the ground or from the cockpit of a plane and the radar operator at the nearby control tower sees the same thing on on his or her radar scope that kind of sighting heineck found very convincing well it just so happens a lot of the sightings involving military people were that kind of sighting they would involve pilots in aircraft they would involve radar operators they would involve um staff uh, up in the control tower of an air base Those are very credible witnesses, especially when you have two or three or four of them all at the same time seeing the same thing. And then when you have, and then when you have that object showing up on, on the radar screen in the control tower, making the exact same movements that the people outside are describing, that's a pretty convincing case. So yeah, Heineck put a lot of, Heineck put a lot of stock in those cases. And as I said, those kinds of cases very often involved, uh, involved military people. So um, he, yeah, he found pilots extremely credible. And then there's the other part of, in a case that was so dramatic that the Air Force would send up a plane, that speaks to the gravity of the situation. The Air Force doesn't send up a plane for nothing. No, they they must feel pretty certain that there's an intruder in the sky to send up a plane to investigate. Exactly. And there was one, one case in particular in the early '50s in in uh, South Dakota, this South Dakota and North Dakota case, where the military plane that went up to pursue the UFO, 
its camera actually locked on to the object, which means wow. that the camera detected a solid object ahead of the plane. It didn't get any footage. The film was useless. But just huh. the fact just the fact that it was activated by the presence of a physical object is mm. pretty pretty dramatic. Those kinds of things had a, had a huge effect on Heineck, yeah. And then there was a pilot that actually died when he was pursuing a UFO. And that was another story that you reported on in your book, uh, where the, the plane basically, what, disintegrated? Yeah, this was, this was really the second big famous UFO case of, of, uh, of 1947-1948 that really got everyone's attention in America focused on UFOs. Yeah, it was an, an Air National Guard pilot, Thomas Mantell, who was um, ferrying uh, a, a plane with, with uh, three other pilots. They were ferrying planes from Georgia up to Kentucky. Well, along the way, some people in, in northern Kentucky and southern Ohio were seeing this strange object, object in the sky m- sort of moving across the sky. It was it was. It looked like a parachute or an ice cream cone that was glowing and reflecting bright light, and it seemed to be moving fairly fast. Well, the local the local Air Force people divert this Air National Guard uh, guard pilot, Thomas Mantell. They divert him to go chase this thing down and try to figure out what the heck it is. Well, Mantell ends up going far too high. He has no oxygen in his plane. He knew he shouldn't have done it, but he did it anyway because he he really wanted to see what this thing was. So nobody knows really what happened, but most likely he either suffocated or passed out at about 30,000 feet and then lost control of his plane. And, of course, the plane came down in a crash dive, and the plane was obliterated, and Mantell was killed. Well, at the time, everybody was pretty sure that this was a spaceship that he was chasing. So you can imagine the chill this put out on everyone in the everyone in the country. They hear this story about, a, a, uh, you know, a brave believable pilot, military pilot, who chases this UFO and ends up crashing and dying. That was terrifying to a whole lot of people. And you, and you can't really yes. blame them. No. You can't really blame them. No. I also, I just heard something interesting last week in a podcast I did with Jerome Clark. Uh, Jerry was saying that there's new evidence about that case that suggests that the, the verdict that's been on the books for years and years and years um First of all, they said it was Venus, and Heineck agreed with that, that it was Venus. Then they realized that it was most likely a top-secret skyhook balloon. And that's what's been on the books for many, many years. But now Jerome Clark mentioned last week that there's new in, new information that says not so fast with the skyhook explanation. Yeah. And he's writing, yeah. his, he's writing an article about that, I believe he said, that's going to be in the 40 in time soon. So I'll be very interested oh, to read, read that new information. Exciting. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Betty and Barney Hill. You write about uh, them in your as well. Yeah. What a great case that is. That was another one of those cases that scared me to write about because, again, I thought there's been this 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 story has been told so many times. How on earth do I tell it in a new way? So I, it was a real challenge, but I really enjoyed it, and it's it's such a credible case. Barney and Betty are just like two of the most normal, believable people you could imagine, and they have this experience that's just completely outside the realm of normal human experience. They don't. I've, I've, I've seen this statement a couple of times in some of Heineck's writings and, and talks that it's difficult for UFO witnesses to describe what they experienced because they're trying to describe something for which we haven't invented words yet. We haven't invented right. the language to describe some of these events. And, he, right. and, that, and that was kind of the case with Barney and Betty Hill. They had this ex- extraordinary experience, taken aboard a strange craft, examined by these very strange men, ended up having two hours or so of lost time on their journey home from their honeymoon, and took them years and years with the aid of a lot of hypnosis to uncover these buried memories of what had happened that night when they were abducted. And um, Heineck... You know, Heineck didn't get to meet them till several years after um, their their abduction had taken place. But when he did meet them, he was able to interview them when they were under hypnosis. And just like with the, the just like with the two guys, Hickson and Parker in Pascagoula, whenever 
when they got Barney Hill to the point in his story where the aliens took hold of him and dragged, they literally dragged him onto the, uh, onto the UFO. Barney Hill got so terrified that he had to be taken out of hypnosis. So once again, Heineck was very, very impressed that Barney had this intense emotional reaction under hypnosis that absolutely could not be faked. Incredible story. I did have the pleasure of meeting Betty. Oh, my gosh. I, yeah, I, I feel That's so cool. blessed I got a chance to meet her. Unfortunately, Barney had passed away by the time I met Betty. But I will never forget, you know, Betty was very short, but she was a pistol. And I wouldn't <laughs> want to be on her wrong side, I'll tell you. Uh, but I remember when she said, if I had a frying pan, I would have taken them all out with it. And so, you know, she was kind of You know, Barney That's was cute. one who was hysterical, crying and, yeah. and just... Shaking, but she kept her her wits about her, and she was just an amazing, amazing lady. Uh, oh, but and, yeah, and, and the conversation that Betty had with the leader of the aliens, it's it's an amazing conversation. Yes, you know, he, he she asks him where they're from, and he shows her the famous star chart, the star map. Yes, and she yes. says, "Well, which one of these are you from?" And the leader just kind of laughs, and he says. Well, you don't even know which one of them you're from, so what good will it do you if I tell you which one I'm from? That's right. such a hilarious conversation, oh. but, it, but it rings true, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, it the, kind, ring true. that's yeah. the way a conversation flows. And then, the yes. whole bit, and then the whole bit with Betty asking the alien leader, well, can I take a souvenir with me? Because nobody's going to believe this story unless I have proof. And he says, right. sure, what do you want? And she says, yeah. well, can I, can I take this big book? that looks like it's written in Chinese characters. And he says, sure. And just as she's leaving the ship after the whole experience is ending, the leader has to take the book back because he says, well, the the other guys are mad at me for giving you this book. (laughs) They they say, I can't give you anything that will help you remember this. And Betty was furious because who wouldn't be? Yes, she was. She, She had proof. She had the proof in her hands, and she was just about to get out of the saucer and back into her car, and she'd be home free, and and the alien leader takes it back from her. What a heartbreak. There are so many parts of that story that just are like, they're just so genuine and so human. How how can you not believe that these people had this experience? Exactly. And she came back with the star chart that did identify you know, that that star that nobody had discovered until years later after yeah. she had come back with that star chart. So that was another piece of evidence. But you're right. I mean, I think some of what probably called to Heineck was these the heartfelt emotion that people had around these cases of being abducted or having these sightings or whatever, that it, you just can't take that away from someone. It's It was just so genuine, as you mentioned, at it's an incredible experience that they just you just can't get away from the emotion of it. So Heineck recognized that and and he's to be commended that he didn't want to make fun of people, he didn't want to ridicule anybody, and he urged other people not to do that as well. Yeah, he respected the experience of the witnesses. Yes, he did. He did. If he were here today, what would you say to him? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I I would say I would say, um, Boy, <laughs> I guess I would say, tell me, tell me about your meeting with Father Gill, that case we talked ah, about in, in, in New Guinea, because that's New just Guinea. one of the most, yes. that's one of the craziest, most amazing stories. And like I said, that was a story that really kind of started to change Heineck's mind about, about alien entities being present in these experiences. Now, with the New Guinea story, that had more than one event attached to it, right? They had multiple sightings, multiple yeah, experiences with that? Yeah, it took place over three consecutive nights. Um, so Papua New Guinea is a very, very remote area um, in Southeast Asia. And um, this Anglican minister, uh, William Gill, one night he and some of the locals spotted these strange craft in the sky just sort of hovering off the beach. 
and there were there were three or four small objects, but in the center there was one large object, a large saucer-shaped object. It had four legs on the bottom. A beam of blue light was shooting out from the top of it, and there was what sort of looked like an observation platform on the top, and there were three or four entities present on this observation deck, and they seemed to be working on something. Nobody, nobody on the ground could tell what they were working on. Um, but So that was what they saw the first night. The second night, same thing happened, only the second night, Father Gill and, and the people from the local village were a little more brave. The first night, they were just too confused to really know what to do about it. They th- Gill thought maybe it's the Americans testing some new weapon. He didn't know. Second night, they're sure. feeling a little more bold. So the people on the beach start waving to these entities up on top of this saucer, and the entities wave back. And the people on the beach wave with both hands, and the entities wave back with both hands. <laughs> And then, and then, and then, someone on the beach flashes a flashlight at this at this saucer, and it starts sort of swaying back and forth like a pendulum and moving towards them on the beach. And and I talked to Bill Chalker, who knew Father Gill, and I said, "So were they terrified when this thing started moving towards them?" And he said, "No, no, they were excited because they had been, you know, they they were dealing with a mystery, and they thought, ah, at last we'll have the mystery solved." They'll come yeah. close and they'll land, and then we'll find out who they are, and they'll tell us what they're doing up there, and the mystery will be solved. So they were actually excited when it moved towards them, but then it stopped and never moved any closer, and then they were kind of pissed <laughs> because <laughs> they were like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're supposed yeah, to land and tell us who you are, and you're not doing that. So, And then the third night, the third night, um, several of the smaller objects appeared again, but the third night there was no interaction with the beings, so. Whatever whatever they were up to, they finished it on the second night. But it's a great, great story. Mm-hmm. And as I said, Heineck didn't get a chance to meet with Father Gill until 19 years after it happened. He oh, interviewed wow. Father Gill. He interviewed some of the villagers, and he came away feeling like, okay, <laughs> I, I have to readjust my thinking because I think something very real happened here that all these people agree on. So, yeah, major, major milestone in Heineck's thinking. That is, and, and also, it's important for people to understand how remote New Guinea is, and it's not like these people oh God, were sitting yes. around watching television and, and <laughs> right. understanding, you know, like <laughs> they weren't watching your Star Trek episodes. So, yeah. you know, they didn't they didn't have the concept that we in America have. So it's even more important what they saw and more credible in my mind because – they're indigenous people that that don't have all of the media surrounding this. So that's yeah, a really good more, point. Their their frame of reference was so different from from ours, that's and right. yet it, and yet it's clear that they witnessed the same thing. Yeah, they did. They did. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us this evening oh, yes. on Supernatural Girls Radio. This has been a blast. Again, it has you've been written it Oh, good. Well, the <laughs> very, book, very you guys out there in the audience, you got to buy the book. The, hopefully, they're going to turn it. this into either a television <laughs> series or a movie. That's right. We've got it. Both of us have copies mm-hmm. right here. The Close Encounters yes. Man, How One Man Made the World Believe in UFOs. I think this would be a great series, and you could write the scripts for it. You're all set Absolutely. up for it. Absolutely. Yes, I'm, let's, let's keep I'm thinking that way. I'm putting in my vote. Oh, it's already <laughs> in the works, isn't it? My vote is going that way. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, thanks again. And next week, everybody, we'll be talking to the people that found aliens through bent light. They're going to show you how you, too, can see aliens, and they're watching us. We're going to find out all about it next week, everybody. Until then, we'll see you on the Blue Highway. Good night. Good night.